the next, and they're more Lisp, and what's up with Lisp, and uh, um, how come I can't get enough Lisp, and uh, so forth. And uh, we're going to hear all about the answers to those questions right now. It's a little bit better dressed than I am, but uh, not context. I know. Some people will recognize this. This is my third hope. This is my first presentation in maybe 16 years. I'm not that old either. All right, should I just flip the laptop around? Only one, if he's good enough. All right, excellent. Now it's squished that way, too. Perfect. Nope. Good enough, right? You can read that. No, it looks like crap. Whatever. Um, thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, <laughs> I'd expected maybe a quarter of the room, but it is six o'clock, so it's all right. Um, <laughs> all right, um, this talk is uh, Lisp, the oldest language of the future, which uh, could be a grumpy old Lisp person and say, oh, you know, you're, you're excited about aspect-oriented programming. Lisp solved that 20 years ago, but no one bothered to ask them, so they didn't volunteer the information. Um, you know, the title sounds like a pretty tall order, but uh, I think the history of the language will speak for itself, and I hope I can give you enough history of the language <coughs> um, for this to be a worthwhile talk. Um, might be a little dense in content, at least I wrote that before I found out how long it takes to make each slide. <laughs> Hopefully there's enough content in here. Um, if you're not careful, you just might learn something before it's through. Um, I am sorry. Is this better? Heckle louder. Um, you know, maybe you know something about Lisp. Probably going to say parentheses. Um, maybe you saw it in a magazine article. Might have come across it in a program book or programming language uh, surveys course. Maybe you experimented a little bit in college. Um, either you thought it was too complicated, too simple, too weird. Um, you know, the functional style isn't for everyone, uh, and most of the languages descend them from uh, Algol, and uh, they look like C, and you have C, and Perl, and PHP, and it's all basically the same. Uh, because it's so old, uh, Fortran came out in 1957, Lisp was 58, and uh, COBOL was 59. Um, you know, it's considered one of the classics, but because it's so weird and uh, you know, was, uh, was slow for a while because the hardware wasn't there, uh, it didn't compile very easily into machine code, it just didn't really catch on. Um, it's been stigmatized as being only for AI, because AI is a bad thing. You would think if it's for AI, you'd want to use it in everything. Um, but uh, here we go. Here's some nice quotes about Lisp. Um, these all come from a number of years ago when uh, people were writing books about it. It has a, a new resurgence now. But um, you know, the first one is, if you give someone Fortran, he has Fortran, which is true. But if you give someone Lisp, he has any language he pleases. And while this is in the afterword to a, a book about Scheme, um, hopefully I'll be able to show you at least a little bit uh, how this might be possible. Typically when you're writing a program in Lisp, you will write small functions that do what you want and then you build on top of it until eventually you've built the language towards your problem instead of in a lot of other languages where you go back to the boss and say, well, we can't deliver this on time, so let's cut this feature. Or, well, the spec isn't really clear on this, so we're not going to do it that way. 
Um, second quote here, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. The addendum is except for too many layers of indirection. Um, because Lisp is a functional programming language, uh, functions are a first class citizen. It's a phrase that bothered me because every time I tried to look it up, I would just get more confused. First class citizen just means that in the language, a function is on the same par as a variable. You can pass functions to other functions. Functions can return functions. You can store a function in a variable name. Um, although in Lisp, they're actually called symbols. They're not really variables. Um, the last quote also speaks to the, uh, the ability of you to write the language how you want, build your little utility classes, and eventually you end up with something that is ideally suited to solving whatever problem you have. Um, it is indeed rather hot in here. This jacket isn't helping. Um, <laughs> but it's part of the shtick. Um, <laughs> so these are three of the books that I used for uh, this talk. And uh, in case I do a terrible job, you can read them too. Um, the, the one all the way on the left is probably the gentlest. It's uh, a gentle introduction to symbolic computation. If you've never programmed at all, this book is good. They, they don't even start with the Lisp syntax. Um, but they gradually introduce it. It has a very good uh, explanation about um, recursion. Uh, they have a nice picture of the cat in the hat, but that's only in the print version. They didn't make it into the PDF. Uh, Practical Common Lisp by uh, Peter Seibel. Um, may be the, one of the reasons why there's a, a recent upsurge in interest in the language. Uh, it was published in 2005. Um, he gave a Google talk, but I didn't like it that much. Don't tell him. Um, and then ANSI Common List by Paul Graham is uh, a little bit harder core. They have code in there for a ray tracer. Um, and there's a good reference in there for the Common List standard. Um, here's the titles again. And then this last book at the bottom, I wish I had found earlier. But they have uh, 12 lessons in there that basically go over everything, um, starting from the syntax all the way up to macros and uh, different functions and all that other good stuff. Um, these are uh, a little bit harder core. Um, <laughs> the uh, one all the way on the left is uh, the book that was used to teach the MIT 6001 class, uh, also known as the Wizard Book or the Purple Book or SICP. Um, in the middle is Paul Graham's On Lisp, which is really good if you want to really understand macros, which I'll get to later. They're not like C macros. And uh, the one all the way on the right, the uh, Paradigms of Artificial Intelligence Programming, is uh, probably the toughest of all of them. The, uh, the examples are in Common Lisp until the point where he develops a prologue interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> then all the examples are in prologue. So, um, this is, this is, hmm? Uh, just to go back to the back, uh, Peter Seidel's book, it's available for free online. So it's a different So, Common Lisp, uh, general introduction, available online in PDF. You can buy it if you want. Uh, Practical Common Lisp, available at gigamonkeys.com slash book. Uh, ANSI Common Lisp, you'll have to buy. Uh, on Lisp is free. Uh, successful Lisp, the uh, bit of a publishing dispute, so that's available free on his website. Um, SICP is available free at MIT, uh, and they have a whole bunch of, um, ta-da, they have the lectures from uh, 1986 at HP. Um, I hope this classifies as fair use. Um, yeah. So, well, let me, let me, I have a, a good few pages on this, but, um, you know, this isn't the first time I've tried to learn Lisp. Uh, it's, you know, like I mentioned before with the first class functions, first class citizens language. Uh, if someone doesn't explain it just right, you're stuck. You know, you're, you're never going to progress past a certain point without the understanding. Um, are there any physics teachers in here? No? Okay. 
Maybe, maybe you've come across the phrase in a science textbook where they're talking about neutron stars and how a teaspoon of material would weigh 10 tons. Amazing. But then they never explain it. You know, and it took me uh, a number of years until I read a book by Robert Jastrow, uh, Red Giants and White Dwarfs, which I guess was popular science in about 1956, but it never made it into the science textbooks. So they could have explained it when they went over the periodic table. We don't have any elements that are dense enough to weigh 10 tons. Uh, they could have explained it when they went to nuclear fission. No. What happens in a collapsed star is the gravity and the pressure compress everything so much that the electrons get stripped off. You know, your, your familiar image of an orange in the middle of a football stadium with the electron pair going round the outside, round the outside. That gets all smooshed together, so you get all these, uh, all the neutrons and protons come together, the electrons get stripped off, they become a plasma, eventually the star gets dense enough that it explodes and that's where we get all our heavier elements from. Like I said, they never explained that. They could have done it in five seconds. There's this, always this hole in my understanding. Anyway, back to Lisp. Sorry, I got my catchphrase in. Um, I went over the just in case something terrible happens and you don't learn anything from my speech line. Uh, so here are some misconceptions. Uh, Hopefully I will, I will allay your worries about Lisp. I guess it's good that the, le the, the text on the bottom got cut off because it's not just good for AI. Uh, you can use it for just about anything. Um, the other funny thing is whenever a problem is solved in AI, it's no longer AI. It's just some useful computer program. We thought that chess was intractable and then we built machines to be very good at it. Suddenly it's you know, a whole bunch of heuristics and depth first searches and uh, you know, lots of trial and error. Um, yeah, I don't know. These, these kind of speak for themselves. Um, so, in the beginning was the Lambda. Dateline, Princeton, New Jersey, 1936. Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. Uh, Alonzo Church was studying at Princeton along with lots of other interesting people like uh, Kurt Gödel and uh, other interesting people. <laughs> Alan Turing studied under him, and uh, he developed the lambda calculus, or if you're studying formal systems, you would say he discovered it, since uh, formal systems exist beyond anyone needing to perceive them. Uh, so a little bit later, I think a year or two later, Alan Turing uh, worked out that the lambda calculus was equivalent to his Turing machines. They defined the same class of functions and were therefore equivalent. Uh, this, along with recursion, makes up the Church-Turing thesis, which covers things which a computer can solve. And even though it's, it's still a thesis slash hypothesis, we can't prove it, eh, we're accepting it. You know, we, we've built all our computing systems on it. Uh, a few years later, 1958, uh, John McCarthy invents Lisp. Um, it was part of a project to do Lisp processing. I'm not sure for what, but lots of log tables or military applications or whatever. Um, and they tried to do it with Fortran and it didn't work out too well. Uh, one of the problems was the, the conditional in Fortran required you to evaluate the ar you know, all, both trees of the argument regardless of whether you're going to take them or not. Uh, not generally a good idea uh, if you only want one of the things to happen. Um, so one of the th weird things about the, uh, the syntax is the prefix notation, where you put the operator in the front of your arguments. And uh, this appeared here. Um, you know, we've been doing math since kindergarten with the operators in the middle. And uh, which is fine if you're summing a few numbers, but if you have a whole list of 100, you don't have to put the plus in the middle. And, you know, what if you screw up once? Where's your bug? No idea. Um, we can thank Lisp and Mr. John McCarthy for the conditional operator. Fortran only had if and go to, which worked out pretty well for the, uh, the machines of the time, but um, the funny thing is that it was not designed right away as a programming language. It was supposed to be a way to axiomatize mathematics so that they could write expressions in it, prove them mathematically through some other system, 
um, and you know, do cool mathy things with them. Um, eventually, the, the S expressions were supposed to be a lower form um, of expression that uh, you would write in meta expressions, which look a little bit like Haskell. Um, and the compiler would change them into S expressions, and then the S expressions would get turned into machine code. There we go, like that. The, the, the project time frame was about two years to actually get a working compiler uh, until Steve Russell, who I think was also at MIT, realized that the eval function, um, he could just code it up in IBM 704, and once he coded that, it was uh, able to actually evaluate these S expressions into uh, values, and suddenly we have a programming language. Uh, little note at the bottom, Steve Russell also wrote Space War. I don't know what really popular means in the context of uh, 1958, 1960 computers, but um, over the years there were a whole bunch of different dialects that developed, uh, numerous incompatibilities between them, and uh, around about 1984, uh, Guile Steele published the Common Lisp the Language book, and that became the major part of the uh, standard that was actually adopted by ANSI. Um, and Scheme, which came along in between, also helped uh, influence. All right, so this, you know, I made such a big deal about it in the uh, description of the talk. Um, these are some of the features that you know, may not be that impressive, but come on, you, conditional expression? I guess it had to come along sometime. But uh, anonymous functions are showing up in a lot of different places, uh, JavaScript being one of them that sort of surprised me. But JavaScript is not the JavaScript you might know from 10, 15 years ago. Uh, Logo was also based on Lisp, which hopefully after the talk you can look at it and say, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do we still teach logo to kids? No. That kind of sucks. Oh well. They stopped teaching the MIT uh, programming class in Scheme, but it's okay. They replaced it with Python. It's still MIT. Um, I, I hope Mr. Randall Monroe got my email about using this comic. While he does have a blanket license for, uh, for presentations, I mentioned that it's going to be filmed, so. Please don't sue me. So now, now we finally get to, uh, to the syntax, eventually. Um, you, know, you might think it's not really used anywhere, but uh, Lisp runs, you know, runs Emacs. Unfortunately, you can't take the code in Emacs outside of Emacs without dragging the rest of the editor along. Although some people call it an operating system, not just an editor. Um, this is bad. <laughs> I've totally outstripped my notes. Um, let's back up a little bit. Um, Lisp is used in AutoCAD, uh, possibly one of the most successful programs of the 80s. Still going strong, still uses Lisp in it. Uh, the scheduling system of the Hubble Space Telescope is written in Lisp. And I haven't been able to dig up the story, but uh, because of a uh, sort of a, a side effect or a benefit of the way that Lisp is structured, they were able to update the code while the machine is still running from the Earth and correct the bug uh, that was causing something to screw up. Couldn't find too much, uh, you know, I didn't have to reboot it. Just Replace the code. The only other place that I've seen that touted as a, as a feature is Erlang, which uh, Erlang is kind of hardcore. But there was, a, there was a dialect of Lisp called Termite that incorporated the Erlang um, message box sort of paradigm in it. And uh, that was kind of impressive, too. It still looks like Lisp, but you get the, uh, the concurrency benefits and being able to hot swap code and things like that. Um, if you want to write filters in GIMP, you can use that. A uh, long time ago, there was a, a groundbreaking AI demo called Sherdloo. Do I have this later? Nope. All right. Um, unfortunately, this, this might have been one of the uh, reasons why there was an AI winter was there's so many, you know, they, they did such a good job that everyone's uh, 
expectations for what we'll have in five or ten years were uh, sort of inflated. Um, the, uh, the software company Naughty Dog also used two list-based systems for the Jack and Daxter games. Um, wasn't quite the same kind of list, but uh, one of the benefits was that you can swap out um, models while the system is running, and it'll just garbage collect the old stuff. Uh, but anyway, to Lisp. The, uh, the weird syntax is actually an asset. Uh, it denotes a, a statement. The, the Lisp begins with and ends with a parentheses. Um, lists are composed of atoms and other lists. And uh, by its definition, it uses symbols it's for symbolic computation. You would normally describe C as a generalized assembler that uh, you could port to whatever machine you want, but you're still you know, just a few steps above the hardware. Uh, Lisp is much more abstract. Uh, and you know, slowly, languages are getting closer and closer to that. So why not go to the source? Um, the, uh, the weird syntax, it's not that weird if you understand it, but uh, the first first symbol after a parentheses is typically evaluated as a function, um, and then the rest of them are the arguments. Uh, in other languages, you have the function outside the parentheses. It's not that different, really. Um, one of the benefits of, well, this could have been done wrong, but the way that things usually go is, uh, all right, well, this slide is missing a few things. <laughs> Um, the way things usually go is you have a function, it's a functional language, um, you have a function and you pass in the arguments, <coughs> and the arguments are not changed. The arguments should be the same when the function returns the value as when they came in. Um, this gives you some benefits that uh, you won't have side effects, which is typically what you program for in other languages. And uh, anyone who says that the, uh, the syntax is insane, well, syntax is very regular in a grammatical sense. Uh, you have a statement after parentheses, and you have all the arguments afterwards. Uh, here you have infix syntax. You have uh, you know, assignment to the left-hand side. You have prefix, postfix, object-oriented stuff tacked on, uh, array access or pointer access. Um, it all looks about the same in Lisp. Um, kind of cheated. These two aren't actual functions. They're special forms. But uh, I'll get to that later. Um, should probably be keeping track of the time. I don't think anyone wants to stay in this room any longer than they have to. Me especially. Um, so here's this big, ugly, terrible, uh, equation. It's actually not an equation, it's a form. Um, the form is going to be evaluated, although I evaluated it artistically for uh, display purposes. Um, so what the, what the list machine will do is it will uh, see the form, it'll find the leftmost parentheses and then find the matching rightmost parentheses. It's building, its, building up a tree uh, in the parser with all the arguments and it just applies the function to the arguments as it goes through. It's actually a prime factorization of 2600. Is anyone still paying attention? No? I tried. Um, like I said, this is a little bit creative because the, uh, the 7 multiplied by 191 would have been evaluated first since it's the deepest, uh, it's the deepest expression. Uh, the other cool thing to note here is that um, Lisp has a lot of embedded data types that you get free. Uh, you have integers, which I hope you would expect, but you also have uh, perfect fractions, or well, you have rational numbers. Uh, these will not reduce to some ugly decimal. Uh, I tried it in Python, and the first one gave me zero, and the second one gave me one. <laughs> not what you would expect, or not what you would want. Um, it'll reduce it for you, but it will still maintain the precision. There's also native support for complex numbers. Uh, you don't have to write that. Um, really outstripped my notes here. 
Um, so the Lisp uh, data structure, the native data structure is a list. Lisp programs themselves are um, lists. Uh, this feature of the language is called homoiconicity, which just means that the representation of the data and the program are the same. This will come in handy later when I discuss macros, which are not the same as C macros. Um, so here are some list manipulation forms. Uh, the quote operator delays evaluation. So ordinarily you would have gotten an error saying, you know, one is not a function and it will crap out on you. Um, car and Kidder, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Car is, stands for the, uh, the contents of the address portion of the register, which on the IBM 704 made a lot more sense, but um, I think it was a 36-bit architecture and whatever. But uh, so Car gives you the first uh, part of a list, and Kidder gives you the rest of it. Um, there are a bunch of shorthand for you know second, third, fourth, fifth. If you really wanted to say C A A D D I A R to extract something terrible, um, you could, but uh, that's that's standardized usually. Uh, they have first and rest as synonyms for car and Kidder. <coughs> um, so cons, which means construct, uh, you can actually use to make lists, but that's a pain in the ass, so you can just use list or use the quote operator and specify it yourself. Um, the, uh, this is how you define a function. You have the, the defun keyword. It's not a keyword, it's a function name. Technically, it's a macro. Um, and add three gets added to the symbol table as a function. You have one argument. And the last value that gets evaluated in the list um, gets returned as the value. Uh, cool thing is that the documentation comes inside the function, and the common Lisp environment has ways of extracting the documentation for you. So if you're lucky and there is documentation for the function, you can find it. Uh, you can also use a command called apropos, and it will search through um, all the available documentation and uh, give you names of functions that you might want. It's kind of annoying after you've programmed something and find out that it came with the distribution. Um, but anyway. <coughs> is there water? Yes, there is water. All right. Um, this isn't going quite as well as I thought, but at least it's all true so far. All right, so as I sort of touched on earlier, um, one of the goals of functional programming um, is not to modify your arguments and the, uh, the primary way you interact with the method or the function is through its return values. So it's sort of like a black box that uh, you don't know what's going on, but you call it, you don't care what it does as long as there's no side effects and you use the return values. Um, this is good because you won't have you won't have mysterious bugs showing up. Somebody characterized the uh, the average imperative program as uh, you know, someone boasting that oh my function takes 316 arguments. Like, well, if you consider all the global variables that you might be exposed to, that's technically correct. And if you have the opportunity to change some of them in there, you're not going to get the same results every single time you call the function. Um, well, that's nice in an ideal way. Uh, you're not going to uh, be doing terribly much programming if you rely only on return values. So you need some side effects in order to get things done. Um. <coughs> so this is a con cell, one block. One block. The uh, the car and kidder um, conventions make a little bit more sense now. Uh, Basically, these two hold register values, and uh, the first part of the list points to whatever it is. Uh, could be a hash table, could be a single value, could be a string. Um, and then the second points to 
the next element of the list. And yes, they are linked lists. This is where maybe people think it's slow. And uh, you do have to go through each one of them if you're doing something like that. Uh, the good thing, the side effect is that you end up with being able to compute arbitrarily long, sometimes infinite, uh, sequences. And either you don't consume them, you, know, you consume them as you need to, uh, or you just you don't care. You recurse through it or you iterate through it. Um, but uh, the good thing about using pointers is that when you change a pointer, the common list system will garbage collect it for you. So you don't have to worry about that either. Um, on a proper list, the last element is going to be nil. Um, damn it. This slide was supposed to be complete. All right. No, no, no. All right, just a moment. Let's, uh, now would be a good time to leave, if you so desire. Um, anyway, here's a nice little program that uh, is hosted on Peter Seibel's website. Um, it's uh, called Lisp in a Box. Saturday Night Live references notwithstanding. Um, It is really hot in here. <sighs> All right. This is how you define a global variable. Um, they put the asterisks around it so that you know that you're using it. Um, Whatever. You know, I was feeling much better about this talk before I started speaking. <laughs> Maybe doing one thing that scares you isn't always the best idea. Um, so whatever. All right, thanks. Um, so I've defined it. It returns the name of the variable. Um, if you evaluate it at the prompt, um, it'll return the values for you. Um, so if you're not supposed to uh, change state, what are you going to do? How do you get all your variables? Um, so there are a few looping constructs, iteration constructs. Um, now everyone just saw I checked the time. Um, do list is a macro, um, which I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. but. It lets you chop up the uh, it lets you chop up the the arguments that you pass into the function. Um, this way, you can uh, you can do things like apply a function across all the arguments conditionally, or supply the test that you want to use uh, for a sorting algorithm. Um, say you had a whole bunch of entries you got uh, you got a whole bunch of files off of your video camera, but if you sort it. Alphabetically, all the pictures are going to end up before the movies. So you could write a little function <coughs> that'll strip off the first four characters and sort only by the numbers. And it'll return the list for you. Um, so I've, I've basically made a shambles out of my notes. But at least you're seeing real code run. Some people don't like the, uh, they don't like format because it's not lispy. Although at this point in the speech, you have no idea what looks lispy or not. Um, but it basically defines its own language, uh, which is totally bizarre, arbitrary, but still cool. Um, it's not what I wanted it to do. <sighs> Damn it. All right. Yes. Excellent. Exactly what I wanted it to do, right? All right. That sucked. Let's try this again. Um, basically, I just want to iterate through the list. Using x as a temporary variable, you can have any number of variables here in the front uh, part of the form. Um, you can also have a, 
There are starred forms that allow you to reference other variables in your declaration. Um, the, the do and uh, let uh, forms usually don't let you do that. Uh, if you use an asterisk at the end of it, uh, you can reference um, values you've just defined. So. I'm uh, glad I'm not doing this on the radio, although I guess technically I am with Radio Statler. Uh, lots of dead air. So if you'll notice that the uh, parentheses flash when I close them, that's really the only, yeah, fail. <laughs> it's really the only feature you need in a Lisp editor, although this uh, version of Emacs has uh, Slime installed, which is the superior Lisp interaction mode for Emacs. It's not helping me too much right now. But um, you can do cool things like compile from a buffer, and it'll automatically put it into the Lisp interpreter for you. Yes. Um, this particular, uh, let me do something simple. This particular um, Lisp environment is uh, C Lisp. It's, uh, there's a little Easter egg that you might have seen in the beginning. Uh, it's only activated during certain calendar year, calendar days, but couldn't find any reference on it online, so I did find it in the source code, though. Um, all right, good thing I took notes. Um, so this is not going as well as I thought, but uh, CLisp, is, CLISP is designed to compile into a bytecode. Uh, there's another interpreter that I have on a, on a shell somewhere that I was going to show you, um, although it'll probably be equally disastrous, uh, called SPCL, which is Steel Bank Common Lisp, and that com it's, it's designed to be very fast, and it compiles into, um, into mach uh, machine code or assembly language, and you can actually see it as, uh, as it's compiled. Um, yes, I'm going to give up now because uh, <laughs> this is terrible. What it's supposed to do is uh, print out the list, one on each line. I was going to sort it, but it turns out that sort is destructive. So <laughs> the, the list would have ended up with, uh, the list would have ended up chopping itself off at, uh, I guess, desktop. Nope. All right. Well, lucky me, I put console first. Um, so yeah, there's something very wrong here. Oh, I remember. OK, good. I get to show you functional programming. I'm passing in the name of a function. Actually, I should be doing this. Uh, I'm passing in the name of a function as the sort criteria. Um, so it sorts it as it should. Um, if you really wanted to, you could change this to something else. Sorts it reverse. Um, or what you could do, although I don't have the mental capacity right now to actually do this, um, and I wanted to get to it. Otherwise, um, you know, you'll write something called a lambda expression. And if you come across lambda, this is another one of those stumbling blocks that nobody could explain properly. Lambda just means function. It's a function without a name. It's uh, the same thing as the, the defund in the previous, the previous one here. All it does is add three. Let's try that. Maybe that won't fail. Um, yep. All right, well, I'm showing you a lot of the debugger. Did not expect that to happen. Um, let me just give you this. Takes one argument. Prefix notation plus three x. The x is a binding inside this function definition. It does not exist outside of the function definition, but that's okay. So we have add three. All right. Well, I'm going to apply add three to I don't know six, seven, and I hate this laptop. Sometimes we get ten. Great. Um, if you think that Lisp is slow, maybe you should take a look at what uh, it's actually doing. And uh, like I said, the uh, C Lisp um, is designed to compile into a bytecode. 
uh, I guess, which helps with being cross-platform. Um, SBCL will compile into actual assembly code, which looks really cool. Can you read this? You know, it's really annoying when you know everyone can uh, can squint at the screen. The person giving the presentation can read it just fine, but uh, when it's an eight-point console font, um, I hope you can read it because I can't make a font any bigger in uh, Lisp in a box. All right, thank you. Um, let's go back to the presentation now. At least the presentation won't change on me. Um, this is supposed to have a little more code in it. Um, here's the joke that started the entire presentation. Um, one unfortunate fact that I discovered yesterday is that you can't spell sick P without ICP. <laughs> so what I should have gotten to earlier is uh, that the, the regular syntax of Lisp, where it's built entirely out of symbols and parentheses, which may drive you insane, is actually an asset because uh, it's very easy to parse. You can validate it very easily. The editor has had the matching parentheses to help the programmer for quite a while. It shows up in the 1986 uh, uh, Sussman and Abelson um, talk at HP. Um, I'm glad that I wrote these down because I didn't quite get to them earlier. <coughs> Some people say that the only requirement for functional language is for it to have functions that are first class citizens. Um, with a macro, you can uh, with a macro you can uh, change the syntax. You can basically write whatever you want it to, um, and hopefully it'll approximate English, um, and you'll be able to program much more efficiently uh, once you've gotten all the the nitty gritty syntax out of the way. Um, uh, the entire uh, the language itself has access to the symbol table. Uh, while you're running it, you can redefine functions. Um, just run that piece of code again. It will dereference the pointer, pointing now to the new code instead of the old code. Um, and hopefully you've solved the bug. You won't have to shut the system down. You don't have to uh, compile it, although you probably should compile it for speed. Um, I don't know. This, this slide speaks for itself. Uh, which is good because I'm having trouble speaking. <coughs> I lean away from the mic to breathe. <laughs> so, you know, I got to this slide much quicker than I thought. Hopefully these make a little bit more sense to you. Um, Probably not considering the way that I rushed through it, but um, the cool thing about a macro is that you have access to the entire language uh, in C or I guess VB or Excel or whatever. Uh, macro is kind of eh, it's kind of boring, kind of simple. Um, nice typo there with a double quote. No, now you see it. Um, the uh, the macro has access to the entirety of the language, and uh, you can string together macros when it comes across another function, it will interpret that function as well. If it comes across another macro, it's going to expand that macro. In C, you often run into problems where you forgot a parentheses in the uh, macro definition and it just does a direct text substitution and suddenly you have a bug that you have no idea where it comes from. Because it's not in the source code, it's in the, de it's in the, uh, the macro definition. Um, this is, I guess, the unofficial Lisp logo. Uh, good thing I didn't have to ask permission for it. Um, this, uh, this MD, this doctor, Conrad Barsky, suggests that we use spell instead of macro because other languages have sort of polluted it. Um, let's see if I can get this to run. Um, there's a very good, it's a good, very good uh, demo that he has um, on his website, Lisperati, that, don't need that anymore, don't need that anymore. Um, it's basically an adventure game, and uh, one of the cool things is that you can structure your data how you want it to, how you want it to be, and uh, use different access methods to only get what you want. Uh, so here we have a nice global variable called map, and uh, just looking at it, you can sort of understand what the, uh, what the structure is. Um, 
the, the plot of this story is that you wake up in a wizard's house and he's passed out drunk and you have to revive him in order to get the magical low carb donut. Um, I would recommend you read this because it's a very good tutorial. Uh, this way I can at least have benefited you a little bit. Um, but it goes through um, all, the, uh, all the steps to build this program up from the ground. Uh, this is what a list looks like. This is the command that goes in the front of the list. Um, you, know, you can read it yourself. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to read to you. Um, so this is, this is what a macro looks like. You have this weird syntax where you are slipping in and out of whether you want to evaluate the argument as a symbol or get the name um, or just pass it through. The, uh, the macro doesn't, um, all right, where'd my macro slide go? Oh well, um, macros return forms to the compiler, they don't return values, and so the, uh, the interpretation of the macro happens before it's compiled. You're basically using code to generate more code for you. Um, <coughs> and you end up being able to abstract your code um, much more. If you have a lot of functions that are doing basically the same things, you can just write it once, you have less code, less bugs, and uh, if you need to change it, you can change it very easily. Um, it's not self-modifying code, as cool as that would be. Uh, this is not a virus programming workshop. Um, macros basically spit out forms to the compiler. Um, if I could have gotten the AMD project to work, which they have a, they have a talk going on at the same time right now, so I'm going to blame them and not the fact that I hadn't programmed in this language until yesterday. <laughs> um, <coughs> one, of the, uh, one of the languages that's gaining a lot of attention is Clojure. Um, See, so I didn't, I didn't the, the name isn't funny to you because I didn't explain what a closure is. Um, but it's, it's basically a value trapped inside a function. And it doesn't get garbage collected because the function is globally defined. And so it, it, it captures that uh, value. You can use it for, you know, stupid things like counters. Or you could use it to keep track of the state in the state machine. Um, you can use it for an infinite list where you don't have to care about uh, creating the entire list. Um, anyway. Cool thing about Clojure, aside from the, uh, if you notice the lambda in there, it does have a clever logo. Um, it's a Lisp dialect uh, with a powerful macro system running on the Java virtual machine. So you could write, you could write code in Clojure and deploy it uh, on a JVM, and the boss won't know because it just works. Um, <laughs> if I had had time to. Uh, write something. I was going to do a live readout of all the badges in the room, uh, but the AMD site is still returning test data. Um, but <coughs> one of the improvements that this has over Common Lisp is that um, they're using the the Java thread model um, along with its own built-in software transactional memory to avoid deadlocks. Uh, you may end up with a lot of contention, but Nothing's going to step over each other. And this is uh, a side effect, if you'll pardon the language, if you want to avoid side effects. But this is, this is a benefit of uh, functional programming, where the arguments are typically immutable. And uh, when you do change them, uh, any code that goes back to reference it is going to get the new value um, immediately. So you won't have to worry about the data changing in the middle. Um, had this talk on a little bit better, I would have delivered this with uh, a little bit more enthusiasm. But <coughs> I'm sure everyone has, uh, has seen this quote before. We're the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. Immediately, you're going to think Willy Wonka. But in fact, it is part of a nine stanza piece, uh, which thankfully is in the public domain. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams. World losers and world forsakers, on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. There are eight more stanzas. 
So this is not the end, this is just the beginning. Thank you, that is all.